Hi, I'm Jan Bitkowski here at Course Spring Harbour Laboratory. Uh, on the occasion of the 85th Course Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, the topic this year is biological timekeeping. And uh, I'm very delighted to be talking to Joe Takahashi, who, who gave the opening talk at the symposium. And I enjoyed your opening of your talk very much, Joe, where you went back a little bit over the history and the way that you tra trace, managed to trace your lineage all the way back to T.H. Morgan, <laughs> which, which I thought was very appropriate given, the, given that the, the power of genetics, um, canopters and benzers, uh, Drosophila mutagenesis, and your mutagenesis in, in, in mice um, opened up the I guess it obviously opened up the genetic and the um, macromolecular aspects of uh, of time of timekeeping. So, can I ask you to give us a, a brief summary of your presentation? Uh, sure. So, um, well, I went back to 1960 when the first uh, Cold Spring Harbor annual symposium was held on uh, biological clocks, uh, and that turned out to be a very important meeting for the field because um, many of the concepts and ideas of how clocks work were, were really crystallized and codified at this meeting. Uh, and so, you know, I went back and reread some of the chapters in my own Cold Spring Harbor written volume mm -hmm. uh, by Ashoff and Pittendrig. Yeah. And, you know, I found that they're actually still relevant today, six, over 60 years later. And mm -hmm. so I encouraged everyone in the audience to go uh, seek out that volume. And it turned out Cold Spring Harbor had it behind a paywall. Um, <laughs> but I was able to convince uh, the powers to be at Cold Spring Harbor to actually uh, open it up. And so it is freely available now. Um, so anyway, so I think that was very important. And, you know, the, the two founders of the field are really Jürgen Aschoff um, in Germany and Colin Pittendrig in the US. Uh, and then in the physiological side of things, uh, Michael Menneker, my PhD advisor, who sadly passed away this year, uh, was really one of the first pioneers to try to identify the location of clocks in vertebrates. And he found the pineal gland. Shortly later, the SCN was discovered, 1972. Um, and just a year before that, this seminal paper by Konopka and Benzer was published in 1971, reporting the isolation of the period mutants. Um, and, you know, I would argue that that is the most important paper in our molecular understanding of the clock. Mm -hmm. uh, because before those mutants, we had no way to unlock the mechanism. Right. And when you, you, you were working on birds at one time and then, and then decided to move into mice? Yes, so you know, when I started my lab as a junior faculty, I, had, I worked on a bird pineal model system in cell culture. But we, we hit a break, brick wall. We couldn't get to genes and proteins that uh, were part of the clock. We could identify output pathways using, at the time, the most, significant, uh, sig uh, most sophisticated uh, proteomics capability, uh, which was actually invented by Jim Gerrels when he was at Cold Spring Harbor. Yeah, 2D, we, 2D gels. Yeah, we used his system. We could see a thousand spots. Uh, a number of them were oscillating and we could identify them. And, you know, we micro sequenced this beautiful 56 kilodalton protein and it turned out to be tryptophan hydroxylase, which was on the output pathway. And that was the turning point for me because I came to the realization here, we can, we have the most sophisticated method currently to look at proteins. We could, uh, we could see a thousand, but maybe we could identify a handful. Uh, mm. But a cell is going to express 10,000 proteins. How do we see those? Uh, and, 
you know, the only way you can see them is through genetics. Uh, yeah. So in your um, in your initial mouse screens, how many how many mice did you have to examine before you found interesting uh, rhythms? Well, yeah, I have to say we were very lucky. So in our first screen, we only screened three hundred mice, uh, and the original clock mutant mouse came out of the first group of mice we tested. The first forty mice we tested, mouse number twenty five turned out to be carrying the clock mutation. Wow, that, that, that's remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it, took, um, it took John Cairns, I think, he had to analyze something like three and a half thousand bacterial colonies before he found the mutant that had was mutant in DNA polymerase. Um, anyway, uh, that's by the by. Um, so, the, what did you then go on and do, um, having got this uh, this first mouse? Yeah, so this was in you know the mid '90s. The Human Genome Project had just started, and we were lucky because we were kind of able to ride the wave of uh, genomic resources that uh, Eric Lander's Mouse Genome Center was providing. So the you know first microsatellite map of the mouse genome uh, appeared in 1992 just a couple of years before we needed it. Back libraries, large insert uh, genomic libraries were invented in 1992. Uh, and so we sort of had to just jump into positional cloning. Um, I was lucky I met Jeff Friedman and then he introduced me to Eric Lander. And so I had a lot of uh, connections that helped us along the way. Uh, one of the funny things is, you know, even after we got this mouse, most people were still skeptics. First, they thought we cra were crazy. We'd never get a mouse mutant in the first place, but we got that. Once we got the mouse mutant, showed us a single gene, they said, oh, you'll never clone the gene. It's too hard. And even if you do, it's going to be like chem kinase 2 or something, you know, won't tell you anything, uh, which, you know, that was always possible. Um, and so they would say, you better ask Eric Lander to clone the, the mouse gene for you. <laughs> but anyway, so we decided just to, uh, you know, learn genetics on the job. Right. And that's what we did. That's and so my, my lab worked as a team for, for three years, 10 people working as a team together, 30 person years of effort, and we got the gene. And uh, the day we published that paper in Cell in 1997, the entire attitude of the world changed. It was, so, mm -hmm. it was kind of remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you were talking um, about the SCN, the supra, I've got to read it, I can't, suprachiasmatic nucleus. Is, yes. And is that, the, is that sort of the, the key component um, in, the, in these networks? Yeah, it, it's still a master controller of circadian rhythms. And we used to think the clock was only located in the brain before clock genes were cloned. But once we cloned the first clock genes, we found they're expressed everywhere. Um, and the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain did not have the highest expression of clock. Mm. Uh, if anything, skeletal muscle had a much higher expression, for example. But it was kind of puzzling that it was found everywhere. And back then, you know, housekeeping gene was sort of a derogatory term. But that's what these circadian genes are. Every cell has them. Um, and, you know, I now think that housekeeping genes are really important <laughs> because they're usually fundamental to life. Uh, well, quite, yes. that's, that's what we think uh, the clock system is doing is, is uh, controlling and fine-tuning metabolism uh, in a cell autonomous matter in almost every cell in the body. And this is, these are not necessarily 24 hour diurnal rhythms. You're talking, you're talking more broadly about oscillate, maintaining oscillations, not necessarily on a diurnal rhythm. No, these are 24 hour oscillations. They, are, they, all, they all are. Yeah, they're not that we're talking about, yeah. You've, you mentioned in your abstract that the things like the timing of nutrient consumption is critical. 
can you tell us a little bit more about about metabolism and nutrition in relation to uh, to the biological clock? Yeah, so my colleague back in Northwestern, Fred Turek, did this really interesting experiment in two thousand nine or so, and uh, we we mouse uh, physiologists all know if you put a mouse on high fat diet, they become obese. Uh, but what Fred did was uh, he restricted the time that they could eat it to either the day or the night for 12 hours each day. Uh, and the mice that ate in the daytime became obese, but the, the mice that ate at night were protected and did not gain weight. Uh, and so that original finding was then repeated by a number of labs, including Sachin Pandas at the Salk, and he did many different uh, manipulations of that. And it was clear that all sorts of uh, metabolically challenging diets can be protected if the mouse is restricted to eating that only at night, which is the normal time they eat when they're active. Uh, so that's, that's known as time-restricted feeding in rodents or in humans now, we call it time-restricted eating. <laughs> uh, and there are many experiments showing that there are health benefits to restricting the time interval of food consumption. Um, and so in my talk, what I was interested in is whether time was important for aging and lifespan because calories or calorie reduction, cal caloric restriction is, is the strongest intervention for extending lifespan. Uh, but when we looked at those old classic experiments, the way the mice were fed were, was very unusual to uh, circadian biologists. They were fed on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings, 30% reduction. And so, you know, we know that mice eat every day, not every other day. And they tend to eat at night, not in the daytime. And so we wanted to um, look at that and see if time or the interval of feeding was really an important factor in contributing to longevity. And so what I showed in my talk is that caloric restriction does of course extend lifespan, but the time that that food is eaten and the pattern of that intake turns out to make a, a huge difference in lifespan. So, if you only reduce calories, but you spread the food out all, all the, the day, you get about say a 10% uh, extension of lifespan. If it's restricted in time, but it's given at the wrong time, meaning in the daytime, you get a slightly better extension. They live 20% longer, but if they eat at night and they're restricted, they live 35% longer. So there's a huge increase. So time, uh, really matters, and all those mice are eating exactly the same amount of food. So that begs the question, of course, what's the mechanism for this extension? Right. So that's what we're working on now. <laughs> we we don't have an answer yet, unfortunately. But I, I mean, do things like you know, the the appropriate enzymes do they behave better? I mean, are they more effective at night, or there's no uh, does the same amount of food get absorbed at night? And you, you presume you ruled out the, those sorts of differences. Please. Yeah, I mean, we don't have um, a very specific path or mechanism to explain mm. all this yet. Um, but clearly, just the high fat diet feeding time experiment shows that, you know, the way that that diet is metabolized by the mouse is completely different day versus night. Um, and so it's metabolized in some way better in their regular feeding time at night rather than allowing them or forcing them to eat at an unusual time for them. That's correct, right, yeah. So that of course then leads on to, is this applicable to human beings? Do, do we have a, I mean, it's never really occurred to me to think that human beings might eat be eat, do better eating at a particular time of day. Yeah, I mean, we, we think that it's likely to apply to humans. Uh, there are a number of 
experiments that have been done already and published showing that time restriction does have health benefits on body weight, glucose regulation, even cardiovascular function in relatively short trials. So we think it's uh, likely to at least have health benefits. Whether it's going to affect aging and longevity, that's much more difficult, of course, to assess in, in humans. Um, but, you know, we know that uh, uh, eating at the wrong time, there are many metabolic studies that have been done now, um, uh, actually has negative consequences on uh, glucose regulation, lipid metabolism, for example. You can, you can directly measure uh, effects of eating at the wrong time uh, with those endpoints. <clears throat> So what is what are the what is or are the best times that we should be, we should be eating? Yeah, so we we should be eating when we're awake, which is the daytime for us, and then we think it's likely that not only reduction in calories but reduction in the interval of time that you consume food should be beneficial. So less than twelve hours each day would be the interval when you first eat something and when you last eat something. <laughs> now, in measurements done by Sachin Panda of uh, UCSD undergraduates, the average uh, person there ate for 15 hours each day. Hmm. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's just occurred to me, coming back to the, to the, uh, the, the mice that have mm -hmm. a longer lifespan, um, do aging related do do age related changes do they also do they get slowed it, markers of biological aging do they get slowed in these mice as opposed to yes. just lifespan yes they do so their health span is extended also uh, and uh, Steve Horvath at UCLA has a um, what he calls an aging clock he's found that a DNA methylation pattern predict, predicts the age of essentially any animal. Really? Um, and yeah, so in, in our experiments, our mice look younger uh, uh, with Steve Horvath's uh, DNA methylation aging clock assay. Hmm. Well, I wish I'd known this before my hair went white. I might have kept <laughs> it dark brown a bit longer. <laughs> Um, so I, the, the previous meeting on biological clocks, the pre previous symposium was 2007. Uh, what, what do you think have been, you, you talked about the changes from 1960, what do you think have been the major changes or advances since the 2007 symposium? Yeah, so the 2007, you know, we were still sort of um, expanding the molecular implications of the clock network <clears throat> in the brain and the gene network. Um, and I would say really the next phase was, was um, discovery of what the clock is doing at a molecular level. Uh, and, and having genes was key for our field because we could make direct protein-protein connections with other diseases. So metabolism came first. The clock regulates almost all met metabolic pathways. But then, you know, in the last decade, immune function is strongly clock regulated. And emerging now and into the future is really cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. The clock regulates many cell growth pathways uh, and clock genes can either be oncogenic or tumorgenic uh, or, or uh, tumor suppressors, I should say. Uh, and so that's kind of unfolding uh, as we speak today. So I think the most important thing that's happened since 2007 is really the significance of the clock system to health and well-being. It just occurred to me, um, talking about um, the importance of eating at the right time, what about things like taking drugs? Does the metabolism of the way in which the body deals with, with drugs 
vary with time of day that they're administered? Yeah, definitely. So um, many drugs uh, that have short half-lives could be made much more effective uh, if the optimal time was known. Uh, and so uh, my colleague, John Hoganesh, who's at Cincinnati showed that of all the genes that are cycling in the mouse out of 12 tissues, um, more than half of the drug targets for the top 100 drugs in the US, those targets would be predicted to be cycling. Mm. Uh, and so it, it would appear that there should be an optimal time for giving those drugs, especially if they have short half-lives. Are there any are there any manufacturers that uh, that take this into account and advise having a you know taking your pill at the morning or at the evening? Yeah, you're seeing this more and more now um, for uh, blood pressure medication things like that. Uh, there are um, recommendations for optimal times. Uh, some some medications, for example, uh, for cholesterol, those have very long half lives in general, so it may not be important uh, depending on the drug. <clears throat> well, Joe, thank you very much. This is a really fascinating field. I, mean, I'm, I have to confess that uh, biological timekeeping has not been uh, a particularly exciting field for me. <laughs> But I think that's that's changed. Uh, it's clearly absolutely fascinating. The particularly the relevance to metabolism. Yeah. So, thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. And I hope nice, very nice to see you. It is good to see you too, Joe. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.